Hey there, thanks for stopping by. This is going to be a little series on building a cabin in Alaska. We're going to touch on here in part one a little bit about geology and soils of Alaska, why those topics matter to us when we're building the cabin, and then we'll get into the actual building of the gravel pad, as well as the building and layout of our post and pad foundation. Here in Fairbanks, Alaska, actually we're outside of Fairbanks, Alaska, and that's what I live in for the time being until I get a proper cabin built somewhere over here. Okay, so in the picture over here, you've seen lots of brush. Then in the next picture, uh, the brush is down because it got cut out. And I have since packed it off over behind the trailer there. And we'll burn that in the fall. Because right now burn-in's restricted. So I came back in here with the old mower and mowed down this whole area. Got all of the brush taken down. This will be kind of the drive area here. And then we're going to come in in this area and this is where we're bringing the gravel in. And I'll do... So basically gravel is going to be kind of in this area, kind of a square here. So the ground's kind of prepped ready for that. We're not going to remove any of the vegetation or the very thin soil later. Okay, real quick, I've got a hole dug here so we can talk about this. Now this area I'm kind of pointing to here now has been cleared off about a foot. And what was above this about a foot, some of it was kind of some topsoil and some man-made rubbish that had been put over the ground over the years. Now, this area I'm pointing to now is actually thawed, and right below this is actually frozen. And this area I'm pushing on, you see how I get a thumbprint in there? When we were first digging this, it was very um, squishy. It was what we call hydraulicking. So if you've ever taken this, this area I'm pointing out with the, with the knife, it's kind of a shelf. This is actually where, from here down, it's frozen. Now, this bit above the frozen bit, if you've ever taken cornstarch, maybe in school or whatever have you, and mixed it with water, it becomes like a putty that if you push real slow, your finger sinks. But if you were to push hard, it's uh, very firm. This ground is kind of like this in the spring. So this is frozen, obviously, in the winter. Some areas, this is called permafrost. This particular area, this will actually, you can dig down, uh, what, uh, 10, 12 feet, and it'll actually be thawed, but not everywhere is like that. The uh, ground in, in this part of Alaska, everything's different. Every square mile, you might have 10 different characteristics. Anyhow, this ground will thaw out in the spring. Problem with that is when you have something heavy on it and it's oversaturated like this, it will actually sink. But come summer, the ground's dried out and uh, it, will, it will essentially quit sinking and then winter comes around, it freezes and that repeats and every year something will sink a little more, a little more, a little more. Obviously this is a problem when you build. There's different ways around building. Uh, one way that you see in Fairbanks is that you just have smaller places. Now in this case what we're going to do to mediate the sinking of our structure on if one ends a little heavier than the other and just from as the year cycles in and out of that cold and warm spell of the summer to the winter and then the thaw with the ground becoming so oversaturated what we're going to do is we're going to bring in a large gravel base and what that gravel base does one is it spreads out the pressure that our dwelling puts on the earth over a larger area so we go from you know 10 pounds per square foot to one pound square foot as we largen the building envelope or well we large in the area that the building's pr uh, weight is sitting on. Number two is that it helps to insulate the ground from our dwelling. Why we do this is because we don't want the dwelling, as we heat it up, to thaw the ground in the winter or, or in the spring. Another thing to mediate this is that we have an air gap between the dwelling and the gravel pad to help uh, mediate heat transfer from the dwelling into the ground. This helps keep our gravel pad and the ground underneath of it at a more stable temperature as we enter into summer and then keep from the ground becoming uh, 
oversaturated as it thaws quicker. This is also why we leave the topsoil and vegetation under the gravel pad for the extra insulation. In some areas of Alaska, this vegetation is actually a thick uh, moss mat. Another reason we're building in this specific area of the property is the gentle slope giving good drainage and also the ground is much more sound here amongst the birch forest. Now moving on, we're going to get some tie power down and get some gravel laid out. This is uh, what the product I call tie power is. Other names for it are geofabric or um, ground cloth. Uh, this this is something they use in road beds, under gravel pads. Um, in erosion control when they build lifts for highways or buildings and such we could touch into that more and, but what it is is if you guys are familiar with the tarp like if you're familiar with a blue tarp how it's woven like that very similar This is a four ounce product. It comes in six ounce, eight ounce, two ounce, many different uh, varieties. It's fairly heavy and fairly stout. So as you can see, it's this woven material. Cross hatched over each other. What this product does for us is it holds our gravel and keeps it from squishing down into the ground below, if you will. It's an amount of support and uh, reinforcement, almost like a membrane. Now, this product is semi-permeable. So the fact that it's these interlaced woven fibers allows water to permeate between them. There are products out there that are non-permeable, permeable, you know, like a pond liner would be non-permeable. Now there's a similar product out there that looks kind of like felt. Now you don't want to use that product for this situation. That's not intended to be used in a tension environment such as this fabric here. Those felt fabrics are intended to filter out sediments. It's something you would use in say a spring box or to uh, uh, f as a filter fabric in a leach field. Now as I'm cutting and laying out this fabric, I'll make a couple of notes that are important. Now when you have to overlap fabric because it comes in say 15 foot by 300 foot rolls or what have you, I like to overlap the product four to five feet. Also you want the perimeter of your product to be outside of your building's uh, circumference or perimeter. Uh, I would say at least 30 to 40 percent. I'm going with about 40 percent. There's probably some specs out there to better better fit that on a structural end, but that's what I'm going with. Okay, so as we start pushing some gravel around, I'll tell you about this cute little dozer. So this little thing I found on Craigslist for a smoking deal. And there are reasons why, but it's handier than a shirt pocket for Alaska, to be honest with you. So it's a two-cylinder diesel. It's about a two-liter machine. That's about a liter a cylinder. If you're a gearhead, that's kind of interesting for you, maybe. But this is uh, built in 1990. If you're familiar with the uh, Northern Tools uh, little dozer, it's the same thing. The parts are the same. That's where I got most of the parts for the tracks and such. Uh, I have no clue what the diesel engine's a copy of. This is made in the Republic of China, believe it or not. And uh, anyhow, this machine, the right side, the clutch is froze and uh, does not declutch. So you can only turn to the left. And the left clutch is oil soaked and slips, as well as the brake. So it's a bit of, uh, it's interesting to drive. It's a shuttle shift, which is pretty cool. Uh, which is super handy, but you can only turn uh, to, well, you can turn either way you want. You just have to hold the brake on the one side that kind of slips, 
and back up or go forward to turn left or right. Okay, so at this point, I was working during the day and uh, had a buddy dropping off loads of gravel, usually one a night, and I'd get them pushed out and compacted and uh, be ready for the next one. So how this went down is he'd drop off gravel, I'd push it out to about a six inch lift, and then come in, water it, and then the next morning compact it before leaving the wet for work, and uh, he'd bring the next one that evening. Here you see where I'm pumping water from. And I'd pump it from that little pond there into these cans in the back of the truck, run over to the uh, site, and spray it all there on the gravel. And of course, here we are with the gravel and uh, compactant. Now, I did six inch lifts on this approximately, and uh, each lift was damp, well, it was watered down a bit, and then compacted. Right, so obviously, in this little video, we've gotten up quite a ways. And uh, we're doing about two, two foot on one side and about three to four foot on the other side of uh, fill. Coming up kind of towards the camera here, that's getting into where the parking area is going to be. And uh, the cabin's further back behind where the pile is now. So again, with this little machine, just pushing everything out best you can. A lot of back dragging, not embarrassed to say that. But uh, pu getting everything pushed out, trying to get a good even lift put down. And then, again, we'd uh, water it just a hair and compact it. Now, this uh, this is what they call pit run here in Alaska. Uh, pit run is pretty much just w uh, pretty much river bottom that may or may not have the big rocks taken out. Uh, they go down through the different soil layers in certain areas where they'll have a, uh, a gravel pit. And they will just chuck this right out to you. It's one of the most, you know... Inexpensive things, if you're familiar with aggregate uh, up here, it's not super cheap to get crushed aggregate. Um, classified aggregate's pretty expensive if you're too far out of town as well, but this stuff does just fine. <laughs> Alright, so obviously we can't let the machine have all the fun and we gotta hop in there with a the rake and make everything just kind of perfect before we compact it. I like to run around and get all the highs and lows in. Pretty easy to do. Now it's probably worth mentioning that I'm for the most part eyeballing this pad and uh, each lift. But I do come out with a level and a string line kind of to get a rough idea. And in the end is about two, two inches high on one corner and an uh, inch and a half on the other. But uh, it came out pretty good for not using a transit. I might touch on uh, transit and other ways of making you know, a pad like this level uh, later on in the next video as we get into building the actual structure. So here we are ab again, compacting, lots of compacting, every six inches, and I'd go over it at least twice. Now I was going to get into uh, laying out and pouring the pads for our post and pad foundation but uh, this video has run a little long and I don't want to drag you all through that just yet. So I'll save that for in the next video. And we'll also start to cover the, well, we'll put the post and pad foundation together, get our floor beams in, and uh, start putting up some walls. I don't know if we'll get to the end of it in that video, but uh, it might be a three video series. Anywho, here's the pad all dressed up and finished out. Just about ready to lay out and uh, pour some pads. Well, hey, thanks for sticking around and watching the video. Sure hope you enjoyed it. Maybe you learned something, and I'll tell you what, I am ready to get off this computer and go do something. So, 
get out there, go build something, have fun, stay safe. We'll catch you next time. Or I think if you subscribe, it'll let you know when I post part two. Anyhow, we'll catch you later. Bye-bye.